This session is focusing in on one of the frameworks, if you like, a kind of intellectual framework that has been very influential in the processes around the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012 and moving up to the Sustainable Development Goals. These are the ideas around planetary boundaries. Um, so we're going to start with a quick introduction about what is meant here, uh, planetary boundaries and the idea of the Anthropocene. Um, so we're going to start with a couple of very short um, videos which illustrate that, that concept and those ideas. And then I'm going to give a lecture which connects up those frameworks um, with some of the thinking that's gone on around the pathways approach and particularly makes an argument that we need to think much more politically about questions of planetary boundaries. Um, and I hope that that will lead quite nicely into the discussion then of the policy frameworks around the SDGs. The scientific analysis is constantly being updated and in the latest paper around planetary boundaries which was produced by the same group um, that did the 2009 Nature paper but this time led by Will Stefan from Australia, so it's Stefan et al 2015, identifies two core boundaries grouping some of these together, climate change and what they call biosphere degradation which is essentially a a, a joining together of the biodiversity and the land degradation boundary to suggest that these two are particularly significant. They're core boundaries and if those are breached or we move any further into the danger zone, then the whole of the Earth system could flip. So it's dramatic stuff. Um, but what I want to do now is raise some other questions that are, are missing from this kind of storyline. Um, and the first is to ask, why does any of this matter? Well, I think to, to many of us, certainly those of us who, who work in the Steps Centre and who think about um, people across the world, one of the big reasons why it matters is because of the development threats. Because what are being, what's being talked about here around the breaching of planetary boundaries matters because via and mediated by social, institutional and political processes, we're getting scarcities, we're getting challenges, we're getting deprivations and pressures, which are often intensifying poverty, leading to greater inequalities around land, around water, around energy, adding to the burdens and the ill-being of people who are often already living in poverty and marginalisation. So that's really why, why the planetary boundaries discourse, um, if it's true, matters, I think. But this also means that I think we have to begin to ask whether planetary boundaries and this notion of a safe operating space is enough. The planetary boundaries idea proposes the outer limits of pressure that humanity should be placing on these critical Earth systems in order to protect human well-being. Yet at the same time, I think it's pretty obvious that that well-being also depends on everybody, each person, groups, societies, having the resources that they need to meet their human rights, to meet their essential needs for food, for water, for health, and also um, in having voice in decisions that affect their lives. And a framework that emerged um, a couple of years after the planetary boundaries debate by Kate Rayworth, who was then a senior researcher at Oxfam, um, proposed an inner ring to that planetary boundary circle, a social foundation um, below which one also doesn't want humanity to transgress. Um, creating a kind of donut shaped not just safe space, but safe and just space for humanity. And Kate has gone on in, in her work to propose what she calls donut economics, um, a nice play on the fast food metaphor, which is, of course, completely unsustainable, to describe um, actually the challenge of keeping humanity within, within that space. The social boundaries in this diagram that are, are proposed were, were simply illustrative. They were based on the social issues that came up at the Rio Plus 20 conference in, in 2012 as the priorities that were raised in more than half of all government submissions. And not surprisingly, sort of internationally comparative data shows that um, humanity in general is falling below a lot of these boundaries. 21% um, of people living on less than $1.25 a day, um, nearly 13% of people undernourished and so on. So the trajectory on the inner bit of the social foundation is, is also not great. <laughs> 
But how might we begin to link a kind of conceptual framework of this sort up with the ways we've been thinking about pathways? Well, one is just to recognise the urgency. So the pathways approach, which you, you've been, you're thinking about in the summer school, um, we've defined as building pathways that are not just about sustainability and resilience in a general sense, but they're also about integrating ecological integrity with these other qualities of social equality and of human rights and well-being and security. In other words, the urgency of keeping within that space. But we've also gone on to say, um, and this was published in a joint paper that, that I did with Johan Rockström and Kate Rayworth in the World Social Science Report in 2013, um, one can actually conceptually link that donut-shaped space with the pathways approach to suggest that the challenge is actually to build pathways, to pursue trajectories of interacting interventions, environmental, social, institutional and technical change that deliver inclusive and sustainable development. In a sense, pathways need to be steering both within the outer planetary boundaries but also above that social foundation. And so, taking a diagram like that, for at any scale and for any country, one might think about some pathways being unsafe, pushing outside planetary boundaries, maybe something like fossil-fueled energy paths, or commercial agriculture, which is reliant on the overuse of fertilisers and nitrogen, challenging that nitrogen boundary that we've seen. But equally, some pathways might be unjust, they might push beneath that social floor. Um, undermining human rights, perhaps something like entirely commercially focused agricultural schemes that are resulting in dispossession, loss of land rights and so on. So the challenge then becomes finding alternative pathways that are both safe and just and to try and build, identify and then build these as self-reinforcing in the kinds of ways we've been talking about in the summer school. Um, and I think we can also connect up that kind of idea with the 3Ds framework that I know um, you were discussing earlier this week by asking those key questions about what directions are different pathways headed in? Are they steering within this safe and just space? Is there a sufficient diversity of approaches? Johan Rockström's talk talks about redundancy, the idea of keeping a bundle of options open, not putting all your eggs in one basket if, one's, if systems are to remain resilient and diversity also to respond to that variety of contexts and values. And also, that third D about distribution. Um, are pathways um, meeting the goal, who's gaining and who's losing? And are boundaries that are perhaps, pathways that are perhaps good for some people, having distributional effects that for others are pushing beneath those social foundations? But, in the Step Centre, we've also tried to go a bit further. And um, what I want to talk about in the rest of this lecture <coughs> is really a contention that we can only begin to think seriously about building pathways within that space um, in a way that's effective and that avoids some really serious dangers if we recognise the challenges as much more political. And to suggest that politics and power need to be much better integrated into this quite influential conceptual apparatus and set of debates around planetary boundaries. So power and politics, as this diagram suggests, are crucial in many ways and they raise some really important questions at several different points. First is that the concept of planetary boundaries itself is political, I think. We need to be asking whose concept, where did it come from and who's defining it, and also who defines the boundaries and how in relation to what notions of safety and danger. So that's, as it were, the top bit, whose boundaries and whose safety. The second area for politics is around goals here on the right-hand side. Where are pathways going? Whose visions of the future are we talking about? Sustainability and resilience of what, for whom precisely? And going a little bit further with those ideas about tensions and trade-offs, to recognise that a potential breach of a boundary for some people might actually be a good pathway for others. But equally, within a safe and just space, we're going to have a multiplicity of pathways, which are going to have different costs and benefits and risks for different people. And that means that the process of kind of choosing between them is always going to be a deeply political one. <coughs> 
The third area for politics is about how do we get there. So here on the left-hand side, um, the ways in which choosing and shaping pathways is itself interlocked with power relations and politics. And finally, the politics of distribution, where I want to suggest that actually we're not here just talking about who gains and who loses, but also situations where applications of the planetary boundaries concept itself can be associated with what I'm going to call power grabs, which potentially undermine human rights, justice and democracy. And what I'm going to suggest is that being aware of those dangers at these different points of the framework are in turn crucial to avoiding them and enabling this planetary boundaries set of ideas to, work, to enable a, what we'd like to see as an inclusive politics of sustainability. So what I want to do now in the rest of this talk is to elaborate a bit on each of those four areas of this conceptual map. But to start with, I'd like to suggest that we ought to be seeing planetary boundaries itself as a discourse. In that sense that Michel Foucault um, created in his social theories, um, around a particular regime of truth. A discourse is something that's co-constructed through power, knowledge, institutions. Um, it's a set of ideas um, about what's going on in the world. It doesn't deny that there are objective realities, material realities out there around earth and atmospheric and ocean system processes. Um, but it does ask us to look at the particular ways they've been put together as a discourse. The earth can't speak alone. Um, regardless of Johann Rockström's idea that we can just bring planet earth in and somehow planet earth has a voice, this of course isn't true. Um, it's always going to take human mediation and the mediation of, of people and their ideas and their regimes of truth to construct concepts. And in the case of planetary boundaries, we're looking at a particular set of ideas that stemmed from a group of Earth system scientists and scientists at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, people working within the International Geosphere Biosphere Programme, the World Climate Research Programme and the Resilience Alliance, who came together to come up with a certain set of interpretations of what was going on in the world. There are important forces of authority and power um, in the way those concepts arose and in the authority they've been able to gain on a world stage and in the ways they've taken hold in the policy world and in public imagination. Equally, I think we've got a very powerful narrative going on here and I know you've been looking at um, narratives in the ways we've understood them in the Pathways approach earlier this week, but thinking back to that Welcome to the Anthropocene video, actually that's a classic narrative in Emery Rowe's sense of a story with a beginning, a middle and an end, which underpins and legitimises particular sorts of policy action. Here, the story is of accelerating human influence in the Anthropocene since the 1950s, threatening planetary boundaries. It's one that's been created by people and institutions. It assigns responsibility and blame here to humanity in general and its industrial processes. And it underpins and justifies and legitimates transformative action. And in this case, powerful justification for that action to be really urgent and transformative. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of that, but we always need to ask of discourses and narratives, what do they exclude as well as include? What do they silence? And what effects might they be having? And it's those effects and silences that I want now to talk about a little bit. So first of all, starting with that top bit of the diagram and that question about whose boundaries and whose safety. How a boundary is defined and where it's placed, which thresholds matter and which are defined as dangerous, is always to some extent subjective and political and thus open to contestation. I think and hope, as Mike Hume will have raised in his lecture um, yesterday evening, was it yesterday? I'm thinking losing track of time here. Issues such as safety in relation to climate um, are always subject to human meanings and to cultural and personal beliefs. And we've seen this over the last decade in the heated debate over the so-called two-degree safety barrier for climate change, um, which has been picked up and deployed by scientists, in negotiations, in campaigners, in public debate, as um, a justification for urgent action for the need for an urgent global agreement on climate to avoid disaster. <coughs> 
Yet, there's nothing inherently natural or immutable about choosing two degrees as the safety barrier. It depends on the particular assumptions you've incorporated into models, and those modelers are themselves scientists who make choices, and crucially, on the meanings and values that apply to that. So, for instance, a two-degree target might be too high for some areas of sub-Saharan Africa, which are going to experience extreme drought at degrees of warming less than that, maybe at one and a half degrees, or places that are going to experience severe flooding. On the other hand, it might be rather low for places that actually might become more productive um, if the climate warms maybe to two and a half or three degrees. So not surprisingly, discussions around two degrees have given rise to some geopolitical tensions about where you place barriers. Scientists often in response to that have declared that the, um, that barrier is, is only a matter of sound science. It's sound science that tells us where that two degrees is the key barrier. Um, and yet, many of those scientists themselves, and indeed the IPCC, pushed a little bit harder, would make it clear that identifying climate policy targets goes well beyond science, well beyond the remit of inquiry, and also has to incorporate subjective value judgments about where to place things. I think the other issue about singular targets around climate or biodiversity or any of the issues we're talking about is that they imply universality that distracts from the very different meanings that such targets might have in different places, or indeed that possible related goals and actions might have. So when, for instance, in, in Sahelian Africa, rural women struggle to produce food amidst dry climates, safety and security for them actually bear very little relation to a global two-degree target. Um, or indeed to anything that's narrow and only related to climate. Safety and security is actually about security of livelihoods, of resource access, of gender equality, or freedom perhaps from domestic violence, which may ramp up as people are struggling to produce in, in drier situations. So moving on then to that second area, that right-hand side about questions of whose goals, we I think need to recognise that those two are diverse and they're often contested and therefore political. What is a desired future? What is it that is to be sustained or maintained or rendered more resilient? What's a good system? Um, we might of course be faced with a remarkably resilient system that's meeting the economic profit interests of some, but actually threatens to breach planetary boundaries. Resilient fossil fuel infrastructures might be a classic case in point. But even, where, even within that space where goals and futures might be broadly considered sustainable, kind of conceptually within that space, there are going to be different views and multiple and contested versions of what a good future is which might need to be defined quite precisely for particular issues and groups and are going to relate to the properties and the values that are important to them. So take a particular challenge perhaps, like ensuring the right for food for all within global and regional boundaries of climate change, of land use change, of biodiversity loss, of nitrogen use. There are a number of alternative visions that might comply, that might keep the world within that space. They could include those prioritising the sustainability of small farmer systems and food production, maybe based on participatory plant breeding. Um, they could be futures where climate smart agriculture technologies like, bio, uh, like biochar dominate. They could be futures dominated by industrial and hybrid systems and large scale input intensive agricultures, maybe based around um, breeding drought resistant crops. Um, and they could involve quite heavyweight industrial investments by large corporations. Each of those could be the basis of a sustainable food future, but they're very different futures. And small farmers, large-scale agricultural industrialists, businesses, national policy, make and other, uh, national policy makers and others would value and prioritise them in very different ways. And as we've seen, I think, in some of the controversies, maybe around corporate agribusiness or GM crops, um, versus movements around food sovereignty, this kind of contestation can be extremely vibrant and become very political. Or one could take a particular ecosystem, and this would be an example of a tropical forest, where we again see a plurality of possible goals associated with different people, groups, scales, and indeed relationships with possible boundaries. 
is this forest, and this one happens to be the Western Area Peninsula Forest in Sierra Leone, where we've had a STEPS project operating, a carbon stock, maybe to offset emissions in industrialised countries to help keep global humanity within climate change boundaries? Is it a repository of hydrological services and water, protecting the water supplies of neighbouring urban populations? Is it a habitat for charismatic forest chimpanzees um, that elite tourists want to see, contributing maybe to biodiversity preservation? Is it a haven of other sorts of biodiversity and these kind of web forms of life among insects and plants and birds? Is it a place of ancestral spirits and social memories for the communities that live around this forest? Um, is it a place of potential future fallows, maintaining soil fertility for farmers into the future? Um, is it a place for women to gather food? Is it a timber reserve to boost national government incomes? Of course, it's all of those, and it's more. But the point is that these are very diverse ecosystem properties and goals and services. And they're valued differently by different local, national and global populations. Some of those goals are compatible, food gathering and biodiversity protection, for instance. But others might imply tensions and trade-offs. And no wonder there's contestation. And again, that contestation can very easily become politicised, as we've seen, for instance, in forests like this, where there have been attempts to enclose them as carbon stocks under red schemes and others, closing out other kinds of uses as agricultural fallows and for food gathering. So digging beneath these kinds of discourses about single use and boundaries and uncovering particular interpretations of what sustainability and resilience mean for whom I think is a key task. We can also ask about the politics of which pathways. Um, and I've been wanting to question what sorts of pathways are being facilitated by the discourse of planetary boundaries. Now, Johan Rockström in his TED talk gave some examples of pathways or actions and innovations to maintain systems in a resilient state which involves some local, some small-scale actions, and that's great. But what we've also seen going on within this world of planetary boundaries and the policy actions and technolo technological actions flowing from it are some other tendencies um, which are not so people-focused and small-scale at all. I'm not saying that there's a matter of determination here, but of tendency and alignment, but some of these tendencies are quite pervasive. So a first is focusing on global governance to define and navigate pathways within this safe operating space. So the planetary boundaries concept has been linked with arguments for much greater power to global institutions. For instance, in the notion that was there in that early um, 2009 report, that the world needs a global referee to monitor national and local adherence to some of these limits. There have also been arguments for scientific authority um, guarding, guarding the kind of trusteeship of the planet. And this was a cartoon that was printed in the German newspaper, so it's all in German, Der Spiegel, a few years ago, um, which Roger Pelkey picked up in a blog that he called Planetary Boundaries as Power Grab. And what we've really got here is an example of a political model whereby a scientist, and this is John Schellnuber, who was one of the, the Planetary Boundaries climate architects, um, as it were, giving authority, dictating down the phone to President Obama, who then acts. So this is, as it were, putting science and scientific authority in the driving seat. Um, we've also got initiatives like the Earth Condominium Project and the Planetary Boundaries Initiative, who've taken this further, seeking the recognition of the Earth system as a political actor um, and as legal entities that can legitimise governance beyond the national scale, supernatural governance, supernational governance. And it's really in relation to this kind of proposal that some critics have, have kind of brought out the danger that planetary boundaries could justify a sort of top-down power grab that could prove quite anti-democratic and actually threaten the sovereignty of national governments as well as the democratic impulses of, of more localised systems. Um, Arguably, such kind of power grab tendencies are even more associated with a kind of third tendency towards aspirations of control that go along with the planetary boundaries discourse. 
These discourses of the Anthropocene suggest rather confusingly that human beings already control Earth system processes. Um, but I think this might be better understood when Jungmann's looking at those hockey stick curves as the myriad choices and sometimes unintended impacts on the Earth system that have led to our current environmental and sustainability sort of problems. But nevertheless, we often find quite a lot of slippage in the discussions between the idea of human control in the Anthropocene to aspirations to control deliberately in phrases like the ideas of steering the control variables of the Earth, segueing kind of almost seamlessly from the idea that humans are dominating the planet to the idea that we can and should be managing it. But I think we need to ask whether this is actually reasonable given the huge uncertainties that we know are there and the huge unknowns in the Earth system and in human interactions with it. If the global governance of countries and institutions around challenges like climate change and biodiversity has proved so very difficult, what of managing the Earth system processes that are linked with these too? Is this actually something that's reasonable to expect? Of course, there are some less overreaching ideas in some of the Earth system governments li governance literature when it talks about ideas of stewardship and leadership. But it's very often leadership in a kind of top-down style towards given ends that we're, that we're seeing there. And this sometimes translates, too, into more national and regional and localised approaches um, that attempt to kind of rationalise and manage spaces to meet a range of kind of boundary-related goals. Hints of this, for instance, are there in the World Bank's landscape approach um, defined here um, and in related ideas about land sparing and land sharing where we've really got scientific and governance approaches to parceling up, often identifying from above through GIS and other technologies, land into logical places to do, for, do different things, to rationalise places to grow biofuels, places to grow, grow fuel. Um, places that where we should be putting so-called unproductive wastelands into better use. Um, these are approaches that do appreciate the multiple uses of land in a world of multi multiple boundary challenges. But I think we need to ask of them whose rationality is prevailing and who decides what is the logical, rational way to parcel things up, who's part of the decisions and who's excluded from them. Are we seeing new forms of environmental authoritarianism and top-down planning justified by this kind of um, landscape rationalisation approach? And I think the suggestion um, would be that they often result in forms of dispossession and of exclusion, as we've seen, for instance, around many land grabs for biofuel, um, as well as processes of rationality that all can agree with. A fourth and final approach is the focus on large-scale technical solutions to um, steer within planetary boundaries. This very much aligns with the urgency of meeting planetary challenges and doing so at scale. Um, we've seen connections between planetary boundary ideas and versions of contemporary green economy advocacy that are focused on kind of techno-scientific green growth. Approaches like large-scale climate <coughs> geoengineering, or in the realm of sustainable food futures, those are focusing on the rollout of modern technologies, biotechnologies, and so on. And these are techno pathways that are often interlocked in, interlock with the interests of particular companies and government agencies, and they help to sustain those. We're also seeing approaches based on extending the power of um, capitalist institutions and businesses into markets for Earth system processes in pathways reliant on financialising and marketing ecosystems, putting a price on nature in order to save it. Um, and again, we're seeing many instances where these planetary boundary discourses are aligning with those of the green economy to push for the expansion of carbon markets, um, of mechanisms for offsets of various kinds, um, payments of various sorts. As Cathy McAfee put it so aptly, selling nature to save it. So, the suggestion would be um, that we're seeing these discourses then associated with pathways reliant on institutions, technologies and markets in different combinations. One might ask though, what's wrong with that? What other processes are there at our disposal? It's not the nature of those processes that's at, at stake, 
But what I want to suggest is the way that each of these mechanisms can align with those ideas of urgency and non-negotiability, such that the approach to each ends up being authoritarian and top-down, opening the way for strengthened forms of environmental authoritarianism and sometimes grabs of resources and power. And as there's those then land in particular places, they can lead to disenfranchisement, to loss of control, often by local people of resources, as the very rapidly growing literature on land grabbing and green grabbing, and this was the, the, the cover of the journal issue that um, some of us did a few years ago about the appropriation of resources for environmental ends, um, documenting many cases of this around the world. So what's missed by these approaches that are assuming top-down leadership towards sort of shared goals and a safe operating space? Several things. Paradoxically, I think one of the things that's missing are pathways that are actually more radical. They're not managerial fixes, but they actually involve challenging some of the deeper structures and lock-ins that are currently pushing pathways in unsustainable directions. Um, things, for instance, like ecological agriculture or zero carbon energy, which aren't going to be achieved by simply the powerful businesses and corporations and industrial structures doing something a bit differently, but are actually going to um, require knowledges, values, interests, forms of organisation and movement that are more marginal, that are subaltern, beginning to have different power and to challenge dominant structures. Those in turn can be fed by and interact with pathways based on citizen innovation um, and on action and collective mobilisation. We've seen so many examples of these in recent years with often small scale movements linking up to networks, whether around urban sustainability and things like the Transition Town Movement or Slum and Shack Dwellers International or around alternative visions of sustainable food, movements like La Via Campesina or the Food Sovereignty Movement. These are really examples of movements from below that are building alternative pathways to visions of sustainability. And also closed out, but I think needing far more acknowledgement, are the ways that pathways can be emergent, not led from the top towards a kind of defined end, but actually a bit messier, um, emerging from the alignments of much more diverse and often bottom-up interests, pursuing ideas that perhaps at the time might, might not even really be known in terms of their directions, but adding up to something that ends up being transformative. And if we look back on some of the really transformative changes that, that the world and human societies have gone through over the past couple of centuries, that's actually how some of these came about. Take something like the ending of slavery or feminism. These weren't led from the top towards a particular goal. They emerged in a way that's much more akin to kind of culturing. This is a phrase that Andy sterling has been, been using. Um, a bit more like the alignment of the flocking of seagulls, and these are seagulls above the sea in Brighton, rather than the idea of a fix that you set and then assume people to follow. So back to our diagram. Um, I do think that there's a, there's a real danger that planetary boundaries discourses might end up facilitating power grabs that actually end up undermining those social boundaries, the ones that are important around justice, around human rights, and that pathways that are intending to steer within a safe operating space can actually end up undermining those social boundaries at the bottom. But it needn't be that way. And I think the, the important thing about recognising the operation of power um, is that it opens up the possibility to challenge it far more explicitly. And to, to suggest that actually each of these areas that I've highlighted in this diagram need to be matters for much more inclusive and democratic deliberation around these issues of whose boundaries and whose safety, whose goals, which pathways, and how do we get there, taking account of some of these distributional questions around costs and risks. And in that way, planetary boundaries becomes not an end, but a means. It's what one might call in the science studies lingo a kind of anchoring device or a boundary object ar around which we can begin to have a richer, more inclusive debate about what kinds of pathways we need towards diverse futures, keeping open their diversity. This would be about planetary boundaries becoming part of and contributing to a democratic politics, 
which I think is both key to attaining those green transformations and surely part of what being in a just as well as a safe operating space needs to mean. So it can lead us to think about governance and politics towards sustainability and development as involving a lot of different ingredients. And some of the top ones here are, are quite obvious. They do need to be multi-scale. They do need to be adaptive, as the Johan Rockström talk emphasised. They often need to be networked and alliance-based, combining different sorts of actors in different ways. But the bits that are missing in the current planetary boundaries discussions and actually around some of the sustainable development goals discussions is they also need to be deliberative. We need deliberative governance which fosters inclusive debate. And they need to be engaged with science, but not science as the ultimate arbiter, but science as a kind of more reflexive partner in helping us to frame the questions, investigate the processes, and debate their implications. So finally, I've got one more slide, um, which is again about backcasting. Now, Johan Rockström's TED talk ended with this quite interesting idea that we shouldn't just be moving blindly forward along, along a kind of linear path in the dark. But actually, what one needs to do, perhaps, is think about a future and backcast from it and say, what would it take to get there? Um, the TED talk said we should do that from the environmental, from the planetary boundaries. There's another way also of backcasting. Planetary boundaries discourse can be seen as the latest in quite a long line of green limits concepts, a genealogy which stretches back at least as far as the very influential limits to growth discussion, which went along in, 19, in the early 1970s, led by Meadows et al. and their World 3 model, which predicted catastrophe. This was, about, this was less than halfway along that hockey stick from the 1950s. But already we had, as it were, doom-laden theorists saying there are going to be limits to the pathways that we're on and to growth, imposed by the ways that rapid industrial growth is pushing up against, they, as they called it, resource limits. They also predicted catastrophe as trends in population growth and resource use ran up against finite limits in the Earth's capacity. But at the time, there were two alternative modelling responses to the limits discourse. One of them came from SPRU, from, uh, um, as it were, the predecessors to much of the Step Centre, from scholars like Chris Freeman, Maria Hoda and colleagues, and they critiqued Meadows et al. for underplaying the potential of technology and innovation in overcoming what had appeared as finite limits and offering novel ways to steer within them. And there's a relevance to that today. We're talking a lot, as Johan Rockström and others are, about the importance of innovation. Innovation needing to be bottom up as well as top down, the importance of innovation in steering alternative paths. But I think maybe the other response at the time is even more important. Um, and this came from Argentina, from um, Amilcar Herrera and his colleagues at, in a project based at the Fundación Bariloche, funded by IDRC. And what they said was that the limits model actually left social and economic and political organisation and trends really untouched. And they took an alternative model, which started from the future. Their starting point was a future that they would like to see, which was desirable and values-based. And it included ideas about democratic accountability and a society that was much more equal um, and was compatible with um, its environment. It was a normative vision. And their model worked back from that to say, what would it take to bring society along a set of pathways which would lead to that kind of future? The original notion of sustainable development um, in Brundtland's terms in the late 1980s also embodied the values of democratic participation as part of its vision of sustainable futures. And I think as we begin to move in this monumental year towards the sustainable development goals, we need to be really careful that those values are nurtured and expanded, not lost, um, as we see discourses like planetary boundaries, which are far more science-driven and yet extremely powerful, um, coming to supersede those of that earlier notion of sustainable development. Um, so my question would be, is it now the moment to seize this planetary boundaries discourse and modelling, catastrophic as it can appear, 
and actually link it to a more imaginative and creative visioning of new social orders that are not just safe, but actually just and democratic for everybody. Thank you.